Welcome. So glad to, to see all you. We're, we're a little, a little slow this morning. The cafe's right out there. Uh, you can stop by. Uh, the coffee is great um, from Mast. Uh, great beans. Um, wonderful. And uh, we'll wake you guys up. So glad to have you here uh, this morning on uh, this beautiful day as we gather together uh, to praise our God, wrap up our series, uh, Fresh Set of Eyes, where we're looking at how the resurrection reshapes the way that we as followers of Jesus uh, view life and view those difficult things of life. Uh, so I encourage you to lean into this morning as we think about the hardest stuff and also celebrate uh, mothers on Mother's Day this morning. Uh, so glad that all of you are here with us this morning. And um, with that, we'll begin with our opening hymn, um, hymn number 482, this joyful Easter tide, verses 1 through 3. Please stand for the opening hymn. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Mighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As your brother in Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
please be seated. We continue with our first reading for this morning. Our first reading for this morning is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning at the 13th verse. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with a trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we are still alive, and our left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand out of respect for our Lord as he comes to us in the words of the Holy Gospel as you are able. From St. John, chapter 11, selected verses. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and his sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same who had poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, The sickness will not end in death. No, it is for the God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. On his arrival, Jesus found Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. And Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, and the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been in there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of those people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, Take off the grave clothes and let him go. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated for the singing of the first part of our sermon hymn, hymn number 483. Uh, With delight, let us unite, verses 1 and 2. And uh, during the second verse, the children can come forward for our children's message.
Good morning. How are you guys doing today? Doing well. Good, good. These guys are, at least one of these guys is awake. What is today? Mother's, Mother's Day. That's right. Are you ready to celebrate mom? Yeah. What do we know about moms? They're blessed by having you. Yes, they are. <laughs> that, was, that was very good. I like that. And what else do we know about them? That they, they, they love us, right? There's this great verse from Matthew chapter 7, and it says, Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? If he asks for a fish, will give him a steak? If you then, though you are evil, in other words, sinful, we may all make mistakes, Right? know how to give good gifts, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask them? So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. And so what God is saying there is that we who, who love our children as a dad, as a mom, as, as friends, we like to give good gifts. And as much as we like to give good gifts, God likes to give good gifts even more. What are the good gifts that God gives us? I'll give you a hint. Jesus. Jesus, yes. God gives us Jesus. And because of Jesus, we get adopted and we're sons and daughters of God. He calls us his children. He loves us very much and he gives us Jesus, which gives us forgiveness of sins and life with him and makes us part of the family. He says that we can call him daddy. So God gives us great and good gifts. And so as much as we're gifts to our parents, we give thanks for them this day and we give thanks for the good gifts that uh, God gives us in Jesus. Will you guys say a prayer with me? Moms and dads, will you help them out? I'll say a couple words and then well, you say them after me, okay? Dear God, thank you for loving us and making us your children. Help us to give thanks for all your good gifts. Thanks for moms. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to wrap up our hymn with High Delight, Let Us Unite, as the kids are heading back to their seats, and I promise you guys something. I'm sitting over there, and I'm thinking something's missing here. What's, what aren't we doing in these worship services? And then I realized that because of the, the, what, what we're going through, we haven't greeted each other much. So I don't want you guys to touch each other. I just want you to stand and look around and wave at each other. You can even talk to each other. you got masks on, right? You can, so, so let's do that for a second. Say, hey, brother, hey, sister, I love you. It's good to be here with you. Yeah, just kind of do that. You at home, you might want to do that with each other, too. <laughs> All right, you can be seated. It just kind of hit me. This is what's going on here. It's crazy. We're, we're family in Christ, right? Uh, and and we, we love that you're joining us at home. Uh, we're, we're just pleased that you can, you can be a part of us as well. And you who are here, uh, this is awesome. It's such a treat uh, to be with you uh, one more time. Some of the new faces I see that, that excites me as well. Uh, we're going to uh, finish this series today, kind of the zenith of the series, really. Fresh set of eyes, that fresh set of eyes is, uh, is the resurrection reality that Jesus rose again on Easter morning, and it, it gives us a new way to see things, right? And that's what we've looked at in this series. And today, uh, the, the uh, subtitle is In Death, 
uh, and life. And I think that's pretty important, in death and life. Uh, and that's what we're going to look at today. I was in uh, the sixth grade, and, and a friend of my brother's, he's a friend of mine too, I knew him really well, his name was Gordon. He, he lived at, at, towards the end of the block. Um, just a nice guy. He came by one night about 6.30, we'd already eaten dinner, uh, and uh, he was on his little motorcycle, and, and my mom and dad were at home, and he says, your brother home? I said, no, he's not home. And he said, hey, why don't you come with me? Uh, they had these traveling carnivals back then, even in L.A. where I grew up. And so at a school during the summer, there was this carnival there. And he said, come on, we'll go there. I said, you know, I don't have any money, Gordon. He says, I'll pay for everything. So I got on the back of his motorcycle, and I know my mother wouldn't have been pleased, uh, but, but I got on the back of his motorcycle, and off we went. We went to school. We had a great time for like two hours, right? We had a great time for two hours. It, it was really, he was a really great guy. Uh, we were like brothers almost. We hung together during the summer a lot, the three of us. So he brought me home. Uh, so like 8.39, and my brother gets home at about 10.30. Uh, he's uh, a, a sophomore in high school. He's been working, he was working, and uh, he says, you hear what happened? And I said, what are you talking about? He says, Gordon's dead. He, uh, he tried to beat a train <laughs> across the, the train tracks, and um, he was killed instantly. I, I think that was the first time that... Uh, that I saw death, it, 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 I couldn't have put it this way, but, but as a zenith of everything that's broken in our world. You know, up until that time, I went to a Christian school and, and, and we would uh, sing, uh, the, all the kids would sing at funerals and it would always be a person who had lived a long, full life, the casket was open, you could tell that. And, and so you almost were lulled in the idea that, well, death is just a part of life, which is wrong, right? God didn't create us to die. That happened after sin came in the world. But anyway, you're almost lulled into that. But this was the first time that for me, death became the, the greatest example of the brokenness of our whole world, of, of what we live in. I mean, I mean, Gordon was young. He loved life, man. We had a great time. He was a good friend. I'm not sure he had a chance to know Jesus. I mean, we talked to him, but he, he was kind of, uh, he was, uh, his family was part of like a, a, a cult, a, a Christian cult, and I, I'm, I'm not sure whether they ever, where ever he knew Jesus. I, I think he did, because my brother and I would talk to him, but again, the world's broken, you know? You know, we celebrate Mother's Day today, right? And, and oh my goodness, what, what a joy it is. I, uh, um, I had a great mom. Um, Janie was such a wonderful mom to, to, to my children. Uh, such a wonderful thing to celebrate, but whenever we approach this day, I, I do it with, with, with real concern because this day is a day of, of struggle and pain for a lot of people, right? Those folks who wanted to be moms but were never able to be moms. Those folks who have lost children in, in death. Maybe, and, and I've counseled a number of women through the years that, that gave up that child in death through abortion and, and are carrying such a horrible burden because of it. They need to know grace, you know. Those, uh, those children that look back and are ashamed of themselves because of how they treated their moms and they can't do anything about it. Or those moms that look back and think the same thing. Or, or those children who were damaged because moms just weren't, were, they, were not what they should have been. This wonderful, great, great gift of God, this motherhood, and, and yet there's so many who approach this day and, and they're hurting. That's our world. And death is the greatest example, or maybe the zenith of it all. The point of the resurrection is not to get us out of here. The point of the resurrection is that Jesus came to renew and restore all things, everything that's broken, everything that's wrong, uh, we, we see this, you go back to the book of Job, the oldest Hebrew in the Bible, right? And Job saying, I, after, after, he says, I know that my Redeemer liveth, and in my flesh I will see God. How's that going to happen? His flesh is going to be redeemed and restored. It's not just when I die, I get to go to heaven and be with Jesus. No, the final victory is that God is going to have his victory for me in my very flesh. And Jesus was the first one that happened to, right? But what does it say in 1 John? Our body's going to be just like his, baby. And that's just a microcosm. 
God would have us see this reality that Jesus came and is already redeeming and restoring all things in his public ministry. As he heals, as he does his, as he does his wonderful work, and now he sends us out to continue it. And he'll come again in all of his glory and redeem and restore all things. We live in anticipation of that reality. The resurrection isn't just about me. Oh, I get to be saved and when I die I get to go to heaven. Amen. But that ain't the end of it. And the Bible again and again and again shows us that reality. And it frees us not to live as if we're in a prison and we're going to get out. But to know that we live in the ministry and mission of Jesus Christ is that the kingdom of God has come and we continue to bring it as we work to redeem and restore all things. That's the reality of the resurrection. That's the eyes God wants us to see it through. You see it again and again. In Romans, go ahead, put that up there for me. In Romans, it says, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. The whole creation, everything is broken. Have you experienced that? Things aren't right. In hope, in certainty, that's the biblical word, right? In certainty that the creation will be liberated from its bondage to decay, in its bondage to brokenness, right? And brought into the glorious freedom, read the rest of it, of the children of God. What's that talking about? The glorious freedom is talking about the resurrection of all flesh. It's talking about God having his way, body and soul with us. We lead the way, but it's for all creation, and we live in that right now. We anticipate it in the lives that we live. Corinthians, it says, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the devil will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. Does it say here, uh, you know, um, listen, I tell you a mystery. When we die, we get to go to heaven. That's the end of it. Is that what it says? What's the final game here? We're going to win. Our bodies are going to be changed. They'll be glorious bodies like Jesus. And all of creation is going to be changed. And we live in that reality right now. Revelation. Then I saw a new heaven, a new earth. And the new here, the, there's a couple words for Greek, the word for new. And this one means new as, as opposed to the old. It doesn't mean that something brand new. No, it means that something is remade. So it says here, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Boy, that kind of sounds like our new bodies, right? The same yet different? Here we go. A new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, that's God's people, coming out of heaven and from God. Not, not going up to heaven, coming down. In the new heavens and the new earth. Now the dwelling of God is with humankind. You see the vision that God wants us to see with resurrection eyes? I remember uh, when I was in high school, I had this, at least I thought it was a cool car. It's a 1966 uh, a candy apple red Mustang fastback with a 289 in it. Pretty cool car, right? Woohoo! Yeah, pretty, pretty cool car. A guy ran me going into the high school. He was high as a kite, destroyed the car. Yeah, destroyed the car. But imagine, uh, I had to get, I didn't have the money to, it was just total, completely total. But imagine if somebody took that uh, and, and not only made it as if it was brand new, but did better. They, they threw the old engine out and, and, and put a, a, a huge engine in it, huh? They put a new suspension in it. They put bigger wheels on it, huh? They repainted it. Would it be, would it still be the car? Absolutely. But man, it'd been made new, huh? And then imagine that you take that kid as a driver, he didn't know what he was doing driving, and you train him how to be a race car driver. Huh? You give him the, the reflexes that he needs, Man, everything can be brand new, right? That's what the resurrection's all about. And we get to live in anticipation of that right now. We get to work. We pray, thy kingdom come, right? And it has in Jesus, and we get to work in that kingdom coming until he comes in all of his glory. That's the reality of the resurrection. First Thessalonians, it says, brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of humankind who have no hope. These are brand new Christians. They had brothers and sisters who were dying. They said, well, what, what's going to happen? And they said, we don't want you to grieve without any hope. We want you to be certain about some things. And it's so interesting to me 
what God wants them to be certain about. Go ahead, put that up for me. Uh, and, and it starts here. We believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again. That's the foundation of everything. We believe that Jesus died and the resurrection is a reality. And because of that, we go on here. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Does it say here, and we believe that those who die will fall asleep in Jesus and be with him. Oh, and, and yeah, by the way, he's going to bring them back. Is that what's emphasized? What's emphasized here? We believe that God will bring with Jesus those. See, God's coming back. That's what's emphasized. The, the glorious reality of him renewing and restoring all things because of the resurrection. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven uh, with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, the trumpet call of God. Sound, sounds like that 1 Corinthians passage, huh? And the dead in Christ will rise first. Job's thing, right? In my flesh I will see God. Their bodies will, will be changed. After that, we are still alive. We'll, we'll join them in the clouds. Are we going to go up? No. Together we'll come as God's people. It's like going to the meal, the family meal, and, and, and thinking you can sit there before anybody else and take a bite. No, we're all coming together, baby. That's what this is all about. And so the, the, the comfort here is certainly those who die will be with Jesus, but the greatest comfort is the culmination of all things in the resurrection reality. And that's what we get to live in in, 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 in the lives that we live in, in that anticipation. Go ahead. This, uh, this gospel reading uh, with, with, with Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, it, it starts with so many question marks. And I, I think this is really important because we always have question marks, right? So it, 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 it begins like this. Uh, now, a man named Lazarus was sick. So a sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. And so the way this worked, right, the sister sent word to Jesus, and, and he kind of tarried for about two days. He go, but now, now uh, we, we have to say, we have to understand this, that, that, that uh, Mary and Martha were going to think one thing, but it wasn't true. Because Lazarus, died, we were told Lazarus died four days before, and, and, and so he was already dead by the time Jesus heard the news. All right? And yet, and yet he did, he did uh, for two days, he hesitated going. And so they're going to have all these question marks, aren't they? Mary and Martha. And both of them in their turn say this to Jesus. Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. Think about if you were a first century Christian reading these words. Now for Mary and Martha, that was very, if you would not have been here, if you would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. But they knew Jesus as a resurrected Christ. They knew that he was always with them. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And so the first century, Jew and us, right, reading this stuff, we look at this and say, well, well, wait a minute, we have more question marks. Go ahead. Again, she repeats it. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. In this panorama that we're looking at, the restoration of all things, I think it's so very important not to forget that somehow Jesus in his godly providence knows you personally. Uh, I was seeing a shut in this last week. Uh, Ron was gone for a few days. He does a wonderful job doing that. Uh, and he texted me and asked me to see this couple because uh, uh, he, he was gone for a few days. And, and uh, and I was sitting there, uh, and the, the, the wife is not able to get up out of bed, and, and uh, the husband was saying to me, uh, I, I was just listening, I was just listening. And, and uh, all of a sudden, he started to weep. And, and, and he said, out of the blue, he said, I, I, I know one thing. I know that Jesus wept over Lazarus, and I know he weeps with me. In all of this talk about the restoration of all things, we don't want to lose the personal Savior. And it's so interesting to me here that this account starts with that. I know, um, I know when my wife died, this was especially comforting to me that Jesus cried with me. Jesus loves you personally. He came so that you might have life in him personally. So you might live life with him personally. 
every day and, and forever in the restored heavens and earth. But in our, our talk about the restoration of all things, let's not lose sight that he is there personally for us and is troubled in his very soul. That's what it said. And wept when he saw the sorrow of the family over the death of Lazarus, and he weeps with us. So Martha went on, she says, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. So watch what Jesus does now. He, he's established his, his personal love for her and the family and, and, and weeping with them, but he immediately turns the conversation to what the resurrection means. Go ahead. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Now, there's no way she's thinking he's going to raise him from the dead here. This was a technical term. She knows exactly what he's talking about, and she says this. Martha answered, I know he will rise again. Read the rest of it. At the resurrection of the last day. He's talking about the restoration of all things. That's what his resurrection points to, you see? It points to the, to the redemption and resurrection of all things. And he says this. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. It's tied to the resurrection of all things. It's tied to the renewal of everything. And it's tied to fixing all of the brokenness of our world, you see? And he goes on here. And everyone living and believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Everyone living and believing. The participles, everyone living and believing. What does that mean? It means living and believing that we are part of the mission of Jesus to redeem and restore all things. This life with him begins the moment we have this living trust of relationship of faith in him. And, and, and we live, you know, it, it's not a get out of hell free card. It's not, hey, we get to get out of this. No, we get to be part of the redemption plan in everything that we do, in everything that we say. This word guides us as to what is truth and right and good. Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. You see the vision here? It's bigger than just me. It's the whole world, and we're a part of the mission. Man, that's purpose and meaning, isn't it? Philippians, it says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And it goes on, it says, do such things. What's, what's the idea here? Why do we do that? Just to be nice boys and girls? We're redeeming and restoring the brokenness in the mission of Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. That's what gives it purpose and meaning. In every calling that we have, we are about these things because in those things we redeem and restore, we join Jesus on his ongoing mission. We are not called to turn our backs on the place we live, but we are called to bring Jesus into the midst of it, just as he came into the midst of our world and began his ministry. And his resurrection is, is both the beginning and the end of it all. Jesus said, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Just doesn't mean he was alive. Let him go. Let him live in this reality. Boy, what a prayer for us. Take off the grave clothes. Take off the hopelessness. Take off the idea that we're just passing our time till we get out of here and, and live in this reality. Put on the life clothes, you see? That's what the resurrection's about. Corinthians goes on and says, where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, grave, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We say, amen. We got the victory. Every single one of us, Jesus weeps with us. He went to the cross so we could have life with him, so that everything might be, might be, that's broken might be fixed in him for every one of us. Yet also so that we might join his ongoing mission. This ends, therefore, my brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. Read the rest of it with me. Because you know that your labor in the Lord is not ever in vain. 
I was reading a book uh, this last week, and uh, from this verse, uh, the writer was saying, it's like when they built the old cathedrals in Europe, it would take them hundreds of years. And it's like an artisan who maybe worked on a half a dozen stones in his life, maybe even didn't see how they were going to be able to be placed. And, and then he died. And yet those stones would be used to build this huge cathedral, even though he didn't even... He couldn't even picture how that was going to be. That's our lives. Whatever's good, whatever's right, whatever's noble, huh? Whatever you, you labor in the Lord's not ever ready, he's going to use it into eternity in the restoration and renewal of all things. Wow, huh? That's the reality. Pastor Nathan mentioned last week... Uh, this, this wonderful hymn, uh, and, I, and I'm sorry I went blank here. <laughs> uh, it is well with my soul. Uh, and, I, and I looked up and I read uh, what was behind the hymn, the story behind it, it is well with my soul. And so this man, uh, uh, Horatio Spafford, he, he lived about 1870, a little before that he was born, and, and he was a, uh, an attorney and, and a real estate developer in Chicago, and then the Great Fire happened, 1871. And he was almost wiped out, and his child, four-year-old son, died in 1871. Uh, and, and so he was trying to, to, to rebuild everything, and, and yet he was a Christian. He, he had an opportunity to go uh, to, to spread the gospel in England. And, and uh, so he sent his family over first. He had four daughters and his wife. And, and the ship hit another ship and sank real fast, and all four daughters died. Only his wife was left, and she was, she, she was very fortunate to be saved. And as he was going over... Uh, the, the captain of, of the vessel said, this is where that ship sank that your four daughters went down with. And that's when he wrote this hymn. And I want you to see where his hope, his certainty lay. He knew the resurrection and the end from the beginning. The last two verses go like this. But Lord, tis for thee, for thy coming we wait. You see that? Not that my daughters have died and are with you. No, we look for the culmination so that all of this brokenness that has touched my life might be fixed. For your coming we wait. The sky, not the grave, is our goal. Coming from the sky, right? Oh, trump of the angel. Kind of sounds like Corinthians. Oh, voice of the Lord, Corinthians. Blessed hope, blessed rest for my soul. Look where his hope is in. The last verse goes like this. And Lord, haste the day when the face shall be sight, the clouds be rolled back like a scroll, everything's been made brand new. The trumpet shall sound, and the Lord will descend, a song in the night, O my soul. To know the resurrection is not simply to know to be with Jesus by and by. It's to see the vision of the restored and renewed reality of all of creation. And how we are a part of that as we join Jesus on his mission. And what we do always matters. Would you pray with me? Father, we praise your name. Uh, this glorious resurrection, you make it so clear to us what it means in our lives. We pray, Lord, that we might not diminish it. First of all, Lord, that we might know the full reality of, your, of you personally touching us with your spirit and showing us your heart for, for me personally and each one of us personally. And what that means, Lord, if, if there are any that are hearing me that, that yet are, are struggling to put their faith in you, I pray your spirit would touch them with the reality that it's all true and you came for them. And I pray, Lord, that, that they might put their trust in you right now. And Lord, help us never to make this too small, just about me. Rather, help us see it's about all of creation, all of the things that you've created, and certainly all the people you've created. And Lord, open our eyes to see uh, that, that we are called to be part of this ongoing mission to redeem and restore all things, even until that time when it is all fully realized, when you come again as the resurrected Christ and make all things new in the reality of your resurrection. We pray in your name. Amen. We stand and we confess our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth.
you ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Now is the time of worship when we collect uh, the offering. Um, there are several ways that you can give on the screen. Um, what really resonated with me this morning is, is talking about how, how the work that we do for the kingdom will not be in vain. And I had this flash back to one of the first children that I baptized at St. John's when I was baptizing Wild Man Wyatt, as his mom now calls him. And the thought that flashed through my head was why it was about the same age as Bree. And I thought, my hope and my prayer is that one day my daughter will marry someone who has been baptized and raised up in the faith. Right? Amen. It's what we all want for our children, for our grandchildren, is that they would be part of this faith that we're part of. That's why we give, so that through us, Christ can build his kingdom, bringing sons and daughters into the family by, by baptism, by faith, by the power of the Spirit. And it is because of, of your generosity that we here at St. Matthew have the privilege and the ability to do this. And so as uh, we collect these offerings this morning, you give online on the way out. There's some boxes you can drop uh, your offering in if you brought uh, paper, but you can also do it digitally, uh, those of you online. Would you join me in a word of prayer as we ask that God would bless these offerings this morning? Gracious Heavenly Father, you give us good gifts. Help us to recognize the, the good gifts that you give us. And Lord, we ask for, for the greatest gift, uh, the gift of faith. Uh, the gave, gift of faith for our children, for our grandchildren, and, and for the people that you will place in their lives, that, the Lord, you would give them faith as well. Uh, Lord, work through us so that heaven and your kingdom would be fuller on the last day because of your work in our midst. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen couple of announcements for you. Um, dads, uh, if, it's, uh, if this is your first time figuring it out, this is probably too late, but it is Mother's Day. And so uh, if you want to celebrate uh, the women in your life, we have a special gift uh, for all moms this morning. If you want to stop by uh, the welcome table that's right by the two big TVs in front of the wall out front there, uh, we have a special gift for, for moms and women. Anyone that wants to go through can grab one of those. I think you'll appreciate it. And then also, uh, Kids, we have a um, coupon table uh, where you can stop and make a coupon book for mom for Mother's Day. And so there's some covers and a hole punch, and you can go over there. Dads, you may need to give them a hand as uh, they put that together. And uh, this isn't just for kids, so if any uh, husbands want to do this as well, you can as well. And uh, go make a, a coupon book for uh, the special woman in your life. Um, Meet St. Matthews is coming up. Uh, we know that we've got some new people that have been joining us, that have been um, uh, checking us out online, that have started coming in person. Uh, this is the beginning of the process by which you get to know us and we can get to know you and how you become incorporated into the family of faith here at St. Matthew. Uh, that's coming up on June 13th. Pastor Brad um, leads that. It'll be an opportunity to his, hear his story, hear the story of St. Matthew, hear about our mission and our vision and, and what we're all about. Out here, and so we'd love you to join us for that. Um, and also encourage you to take a moment, fill out the connection card, let us know that you're here, uh, let us know if there's any way that uh, we can pray for you. You can also download the app uh, by texting uh, the number 77977, text St. Matthew app to that number, and uh, that will get you to download uh, the app. And I think that covers it for my announcements. With that, we uh, move to a time of prayer. Uh, for those who are in need in our community, I want to share with you a, a couple of prayer requests that, that came in this past week. Uh, we pray for uh, continued healing for Michael and his, his eldest son, Nathan, as uh, they're estranged. I lift up uh, Chrissy Beadle as she recovers from surgery. Uh, 
for Lorna, who is diagnosed with an eye infection, for Daryl, who has been hop- hospitalized with a hip infection, uh, for Bruce and Lois Maggio, as they are adjusting to medical care at home, uh, for Dudley Adair, a friend of Nancy Hansen that uh, is struggling with health concerns, and for Rick Gibbs, a friend of the Broders who's recovering uh, from surgery and all the concerns that come with that. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Please stand. Heavenly Father, teach us to seek you and listen to your voice in your word. Increase our faith that we may believe that you are able to do more than we can ask or imagine. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, your Son in his incarnation took on human flesh and was born of the Virgin Mary. He submitted to his mother, honoring and obeying her, and so so fulfilling the command where we have not. On this Mother's Day, graciously accept our thanksgiving for our mothers, whom you have given us. Teach us to teach us to honor them, loving, obeying, and giving thanks for them, as is fitting in your strength. Strengthen all women with child, and give them safe delivery. Comfort all women who long to have children but cannot, that they may find their consolation in you and your unfailing love. Lord, in your mercy. Loving Father, in love you adopted us as your own dear children. We give you thanks for mothers who have adopted to exemplify that love. We give thanks for spiritual mothers who have cared for and nurtured faith in you. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty Father, you whirl this world by your established authorities in ways that we do not always understand. Bless our nation's leaders and cause them to serve wisely for our good. Give earthly peace and justice that is in accord with your commandments and that order that you have revealed. Bring an end to injustice, violence, and disdain for your truth. And let us receive all good things with thanksgiving. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, giver of all that is good, grant your healing and support to all who are in sorrow and need, sickness, or adversity, especially Michael and Nathan, Chrissy, Lorna, Daryl, Bruce and Lois, Dudley, and Rick, as well as all those that we lift up in the quiet of our hearts. Heal and restore. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, Father, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death, that we might not die eternally, because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity. All who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, We laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. The holy, holy Lord, God of Sabaoth adored, heaven and earth in full acclaim, shout the glory of your name. Sing Hosanna in the highest, sing Hosanna to the Lord. Truly blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. The same way also after supper he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave to them all, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Jesus Christ. O Jesus Christ, true Lamb of God, have mercy on us, Lord, we pray. O Jesus Christ. for you. Take and eat the body of Christ given for you. Take and eat the body.
May this, the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you, body and soul, unto life everlasting. Depart in his peace. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. We close today singing Alleluia, Jesus is Risen, hymn number 474. great to be with you this morning. Jesus has risen. He makes all things new, brand new, and we're a part of that. May, may you know the joy of living in the re resurrection reality uh, as you look into eternity and as you're part of this mission together. May, may God be with you this week.